Just a few words, Mr. Lincoln. The story of the Gettysburg Address. President Lincoln was one busy man. He had two big jobs. He had to free the slaves, and he had to win the war, the Civil War. It had begun in eighteen sixty one. Americans against Americans. Some Southern states had quit the Union. They wanted their own country. They said. But Lincoln couldn't let them run off like that. This was the United States, wasn't it? That's the way it had started. That's the way it should be. Besides these big jobs, the president had little jobs too. He had to shake hands. Everyone wanted to shake the president's hand, so he shook and shook and shook. Often his own hand was swollen afterward. And he had to write letters from all over the country. People wrote to him, "Why didn't he do this? Why hadn't he done that?" Some just wanted his autograph. He couldn't take time to write Abraham Lincoln, so he just wrote A. Lincoln. People even lined up outside his office to see him. They buzzed around his door like bees. He said. All had hard luck stories. When he could, he, the president helped them. He hated to say no. But sometimes there was a special knock on his door: three light taps and two loud thumps. This wasn't a hard luck story. This was the president's ten-year-old son, Tad. His real name was Thomas, but his nickname was Tad. Why he was just like a tadpole, his father said, wiggly. Ted and his father were best friends. Sometimes they played and roughhoused together before supper. Sometimes Ted went with his father to visit the soldiers. He would wear his own uniform, carry his own sword, and ride his own little gray horse. Sometimes he'd walk with his father to the War Department for the latest news. Often the news was bad. For the first two years of the war, everything went wrong. The soldiers needed blankets, but the blankets they got turned out to be rotten. They needed knapsacks. The knapsacks fell apart. Worst of all, the South kept winning. Battle after battle, Lincoln said his generals had the slows. They didn't move fast enough, or hard enough, or soon enough. Then, in July eighteen sixty-three, the Southern Army moved north. They were going to whip the Yankees on their own land, so they marched into Pennsylvania. Near the little town of Gettysburg, the two armies met and fought. For three days, cannons boomed, swords flashed, horses reared and screamed. It was a terrible battle. Twenty thousand Southern soldiers were killed or wounded. Twenty-three thousand Northern ones. The North won. Lincoln was thankful. Still, he felt sad. So many dead boys. Not one of them ready to die. And the war wasn't even over. My heart is like lead, he said. People decided to build a special cemetery in Gettysburg, just for the fallen soldiers, and they would hold a special service to honor them. They set the date for October twenty-third, and they asked Edward Everett to speak. He was the grandest speaker in the country. He looked grand. He rolled out grand words in a grand way, but Mr. Everett needed more time to put his grand words together. So they, the date was changed to November nineteenth. Then the people thought the president should speak too. Not long, just a few words. They said. President Lincoln did have something to say, but he would keep his speech short. He said, short, short, short. He wanted to talk about why they were fighting, not just to win. 
not just to free the slaves, but to keep America the way George Washington had meant it to be, a country run by the people, for the people, all the people, united, with no hard feelings when the war was over. He wanted his speech to be just right, but of course President Lincoln was one busy man. Still, by November 15th, his speech was almost done. He'd even read it aloud to see how the words sounded. All it needed was another lick, he said. Tad wasn't around while his father was writing. He was in bed, sick. The doctor didn't know what was wrong. That was not a good sign, Mrs. Lincoln said. She was beside herself with more worry. The president was too. He just hoped Tad would be better before he went to Gettysburg. On November 18th, Lincoln had to leave, and Tad was not better. His fever was still high. Of course, Tad had to take medicine, but he didn't like it. Sometimes only his father could get him to take it, and his father was leaving. It was hard for Lincoln to say goodbye, but he had to. Lincoln went to, to Gettysburg in a special four-car train. It was decorated with red, white, and blue streamers, and it was filled with important people. All of them wanted to talk with the president. So the president talked all the way to Gettysburg. The stories told that Lincoln wrote his speech on the train. Just scratch it out on the back of an old envelope. That is not true. His speech was in his pocket, all written except for a last lick. In Gettysburg, everyone wanted to honor the president. That evening, a group of singers sang to him and then asked for a speech. But the president told them he had nothing to say. If he tried, he might say something foolish. The singers didn't think much of that. They just hoped the president would do better the next day. Gettysburg was crowded with visitors, important visitors. In the house where Lincoln was staying, there were not even enough beds to go around. Mr. Everett was told he might have to share his bed with the governor, but at the last minute, another bed was found for the governor. Mr. Everett's daughter was not so lucky. She had to share her bed with two other ladies. It was too much for the bed. It broke down in the middle of the night. The three ladies crashed to the floor. President Lincoln, of course, had a room to himself, but before going to bed, he went over his speech. He gave it a last lick, yet he kept thinking about Tad. How was he? Had his fever gone down? Luckily, a telegram arrived from Mrs. Lincoln. Tad was much better, she said. That was just what Lincoln wanted to hear. He had never read sweeter sounding words. November 19th was a bright sunny day. At 10 o'clock in the morning, Lincoln went outside. A horse was waiting for him, a short horse, and Lincoln was a tall man, six feet four, with long legs. People laughed about how long the president's legs were, but they seemed about right to him, he said, just long enough to reach the ground. But that day, with a horse between his legs, they still almost reached the ground. For the big parade to the cemetery, the president was given a bigger horse, a big, proud-looking chestnut horse. No one could miss Lincoln now. There he is, people said. See, in his high stovepipe hat. First came the band, then soldiers, then President Lincoln, some state governors, and other important people, but not Mr. Everett. He had gone to see the battlefield, and he wasn't back. At the cemetery, the president climbed on the platform. A small sofa was there for him, but out in front, the people had to stand. Fifteen to twenty thousand of them, crowding close, jostling each other. Fathers holding children on their shoulders, all trying to see the president.
Mr. Everett was to speak first, but he still had not come, so everyone waited. The band played, and the people stood, and the president sat looking out at the fields. At all the fresh graves and wooden markers, thousands of wooden markers, and under every marker was the body of a fallen soldier. At last, Mr. Everett came. Of course, he was worth waiting for. Just listen to that voice, people said. Making a grand story of the Battle of Gettysburg, placing it right beside the great, great battles of history. But he didn't stop. For one solid hour, he talked. People expected Mr. Everett to talk a long time. They loved what he said. Still, they were standing. They were tired and hungry. For another hour, Mr. Everett talked. Then a glee club sang. Then, at last, the President of the United States, President Lincoln, stood, put on a pair of steel rimmed spectacles, and pulled a single sheet of paper from his pocket. Lincoln talked as if he were talking to every single person in the country telling them not to give up on the idea of one country. He talked as if he were talking to George Washington, too, telling him that they wouldn't let him down, and as if he were talking to the fallen soldiers, telling them they had not died for nothing. It was a short speech, and it was over. Ten sentences, 271 words, Lincoln sat down. People were so excited to hear the president, they had hardly begun to listen to what he said. They were still noticing his accent. He had a Kentucky accent after all this time, but suddenly there he was, sitting down. He was finished. It took longer to boil an egg. They clapped, but perhaps they were slow about it. In any case, Lincoln supposed his speech had fizzled. It fell like a wet blanket, he said. He was sure that no one would remember what was said here. He'd even said so in his speech. All afternoon, Lincoln shook hands with the people of Gettysburg. When he got on the train that evening, he was tired. He put his long legs up on a train seat, and he closed his eyes. He had no idea that his speech would be printed in newspapers all over the country and that people would read it again and again and praise it. Even Mr. Everett wrote to Lincoln, the president had said more in two minutes, Mr. Everett declared, than he had said in two hours. Americans agreed they would remember Lincoln's words and go on remembering. It was one of the greatest speeches in American history, but by the time Lincoln heard what was being said, he was doing other things. After all, he was one busy man. This is the speech President Lincoln gave at the Gettysburg. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives, that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they 
who found here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly reserve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you.